Welcome to chapter 8, uh, which is about database management systems. So this is the last part of the uh, system software variety, which we spoke about earlier in chapter 6 and 7, but a significant part in today's world. Uh, what is a database and why is it required and why were DBMS has evolved over time? So if you go back in history, you'll find that we've always had what are known as discrete file systems. So for example, you can create an employee master file and you create a sales file and you create a purchase file. Each was through COBOL or through BASIC or some of those languages create separate, separate files associated with each program. Now, one of the problems with this was that across the organization, you many a time had copies of those files lying in different departments. And when I say files, they are not physical files, but software based files or database files lying at different places. One of the problems is once you have duplication of data across the organization, you have inconsistency in the data. So for example, the MIS reported by the payroll department would not match, let's say, with the MIS reported by the finance as to how much of salary was actually paid. And likewise, the sales data would probably be inconsistent across branches. So branch generate their own MIS and the head office which consolidates all the branch data again generates a separate MIS and those two never match. Now these were problems because there were discrete files running at different places. The other problem with discrete file systems is that you need to process and reprocess unnecessarily. You also waste a lot of storage space because there is storage required at every location for the same file or the same content more or less. Now to in order to solve this problem, there's a committee formed which actually created this idea or this notion of a central database. Uh, Codacil was a committee which actually created this concept of a central database. Now, for example, what a database does for you is eliminates this duplication of data which you see. The other thing which it does for you is probably eliminates the uh, possibility problems that you associate between data and the software itself. So like I said, there's a file associated with every COBOL program. Now every time the file structure changes, the program also undergoes the change. And every time you want to change the program, you probably want to change the file structure. So that dependence between file and program, which was so immense at that time, we could not afford to have. So you could keep modifying. Just for example, if Google was to keep changing its databases, we don't even feel that they are actually changing it in the background. How are they able to manage that flexibility? It's only possible because of central database management systems. A DBMS is therefore a complex set of software that programs that controls the organization, the storage, the retrieval of data in a database. And a DBMS, uh, therefore, uh, the variety of DBMS is that you see in the marketplace, one, for example, Oracle is a highly popular database. SQL Server is there on all Microsoft systems typically and MS Access at a local level that you might want to use. DB2 is an example of a database sold by IBM, for example, and uh, many more. But of course, the more popular ones are typically the ones listed here. Databases consist of three basic uh, functionalities. One what you call as a data uh, definition language, which is to say that I need to indicate to the database the structure of the database, what are the tables inside the database, within the tables, what are the columns that need to be there, each column, what should be the width of it, what is the nature of data that is going to go into that column. For example, if I have a column called name, then it's a text data and it's probably 40 characters wide. And then I have a salary uh, column, for example, which probably is a variable uh, numeric kind of a, uh, data and therefore I might define it as a real number or might de define it as integer number but with a breakup saying that two digits are for decimal or after decimal. Now how do I define this and create a sort of a database table structure first and having created the structure, how do I insert data into it which is the function of the data control or the, da the data manipulation language which enables you to manipulate the data inside it, query it, uh, compute from it, for example, add up the salaries of all people and such things. And then I have a data control language which enables me to actually provide security levels 
to the data that I have. For example, I might be uh, able to say that don't allow people to view the data of their bosses. So I can see my own salary, I can see salary of people below me, but not of salary of people above me. Now, how do I define this security level? And that's probably a, a management issue which is handled by the data control language. There are various models of database which have been there in history. And today, of course, we talk about relational databases and object relational database models, which are very popular. But in the days gone by, we had what are known as hierarchical and network databases. Let's look at what this means. Here's an example of a purchase order uh, data. The purchase order has uh, two things. One is the header, you know, the top portion of the purchase order, which contains number, supplier, and those kind of details. And then you have, uh, then you have the item details and the supplier details uh, at another level. And then you have the uh, hierarchy between them, all structured and predefined. So if I want to ever access the details of the item which are purchased on this purchase order, which are stored in this purchase order detail file, I have to necessarily access it through purchase order number, then go to the specific item in that purchase order, the line item as you call it, and within the line item, then go to the item details, which is the name of the item, description, unit of measure, etc. So there was a strict hierarchy between the files that you store on the disk. Therefore, these were known as hierarchical databases. You could not directly query items, for example. You had to necessarily flow through a given hierarchy to access information. On the other hand, today's relational database tables are very simple. They are two-way, two-dimensional tables. There are rows and there are columns. So for example, here I have an example of a purchase order number, purchase order date, supplier code, which is one table. So I can have multiple purchase orders here, multiple purchase order dates and corresponding supplier details. I have another table which says the same purchase order number as a cross-reference known as a key, as they call it in database jargon, primary key. And I have an item code. So when you talk of purchase order line items, in that purchase order, if you add, uh, let's say, order 10 items, they occupy 10 different lines on the purchase order. Each one of them has an entry like this. So PO number and item code. And then for you have two other tables, one which is an item master table, which contains static information about an item, which is the item code, description, unit of measure, the price, etc. And on the other hand, you have supplier master, which is supplier code, supplier details, etc. So you will find the database here consists of several separate tables. Each table is functionally complete in itself. And you can directly query that table separately. There is no restriction like in the hierarchical uh, concept which we saw that you had to necessarily go from top to bottom. Here I can query each one of these separately. For example, if I want to find out who are the suppliers who are located in Mumbai, I can actually go through this supplier master table and let's assume that there's one column which says PIN code. I can search on PIN code to find out suppliers who reside in a particular area. And therefore, each table can be separately queried but the beauty of it is using structured query language, I can even combine these tables and answer a single query, which is a complex query, saying that show me a list of purchase orders placed on suppliers who reside in Mumbai. And so therefore it will find out from this table which are the suppliers located in Mumbai, that's part of query one. And then for these suppliers, which are the purchase orders which were issued to them? So it is going to multiple tables, binding them dynamically. The idea of dynamically binding separate tables to answer a particular query is a very powerful concept in relational databases. Now, what are the typical features of any database management software? And we discuss some of the problems that we face with uh, uh, discrete file systems. And you'll notice here that DBMSs answer most of the problems associated with discrete file systems. For one, 
it enables you to create and modify data structures very easily. So you, you are initially you can have only five columns, then you detect that one more column needs to be added to your database, it's easily possible to do. Storage and retrieval of data is very powerfully done using structured query languages and fourth generation languages of that kind. It provides role based security to people and privileges. So the example I quoted, can I limit the search of salary to all people working below me and not above me. So these kind of column level security also is possible. If I am not allowed to uh, ask, modify data for example in a particular column, I can view it but not change it. I cannot delete a record but I can inspect it. So these are rules which are uh, based on the role that I perform in the organization and based on the privileges that are defined for me which can be implemented and more importantly they are implemented at a central database level. So no one can bypass these rules irrespective of where you are connecting from. The other thing it does is it provides transaction security. So the example I quoted of uh, online payment transaction uh, which suppose uh, just when you say let's say the transaction is 100 rupees worth and the amount of 100 rupees is deducted from your account but it is not yet credited to the uh, customer's account or supplier's account and at that time the line stops so for some reason the computer fails. What happens to your account? Your money is gone but your supplier says that I have not received the money. Now in such cases the transaction has to be rolled back. So roll back and roll forward is a function which the operating system provides in the form of transaction security. It also enables concurrent access. Actually the formal definition of a database is a shared collection of information. Unless data is concurrently accessed and shared, the real power of the data can't be seen. So for example, in a large company, many a time each person maintains separate pieces of the same information. Why not pool it together at one place? Not only it makes it consistent, so that at the source where the data is created is the only point where the data is really entered into the system and subsequently all other people just consume that information without having to retype it and make errors in the process. So there is consistency of data, there is uh, let's say optimization of the space and storage that is required of the data, there is no redundancy of it and there is efficiency in processing. The other thing which databases enable you to do is manage concurrent access. The real definition of a database is a shared pool of information. Now, unless there is possibility of sharing, a DBMS does not make sense and that was the grand dream of the people who constructed the concept of database. The idea that an organization will have a single large database and everybody will directly access it, thereby making data capture only at the source of the data where it is first created and ensure that everybody gets a consistent piece of information all across the organization is a real beautiful concept. Now when this happens, you can imagine that if multiple people try and access the same data at the same time, take for example, when you are trying to book a ticket on a railway or let's say an airplane, when I am asking for ticket uh, say to seat number 24C, you can very well imagine that hundreds of other people are probably simultaneously trying to book the same ticket at the same time. Now how do you resolve this conflict and database systems enable you to resolve the concept. So somebody who has taken the seat first and locked it, there is a mechanism of locking of a database row, somebody who has actually taken that row and locked it gets the first access to it. While the others are still allowed to see it but they only can view it but not lock it again till the time the first fellow has not released it. So for example, I can inspect the seat 24C and then decide oh this is not the seat I really want and then I release the lock. Now somebody else can probably lock that seat and probably book the ticket if he wishes to. So that is an example of concurrency control as you call it in database terms. The other interesting thing which they do is about putting business rules. So for example, if I have a rule that you shall not give more than 5% discount to your customer, that rule can be actually stored as part of my uh, in, let's say product master database. So against that product if I have put a rule saying that not more than 5% discount, 
no matter who you are and how you access the database, you will not be allowed to give any, or even if you try and write a program to do that, it will just not allow you to bypass the rule and give more discount. So in case I'm running an organization where I want to enforce centralized control on practices and procedures followed all across my company, irrespective of the city where you're operating it, then business rules are very important and standardized business rules are extremely important. Databases help you to implement these standardized role, rules. Now, one of the challenges that companies are facing today is tremendous growth, growth in terms of turnover, but more importantly, growth in terms of data. Imagine an insurance company, for example, they're selling policies left, right, and center. Every policy probably lasts for 20 years. So you can imagine that all the scanned documents of your certificates and your application form and everything that they collect from you and every transaction that they do with you, the premiums that you paid, so on and so forth, has to be kept for 20 years and kept live and accessible for 20 years. So if there are millions of people who are joining in as members of that insurance company, you can only imagine that the size of the database is going to grow larger and larger. Now, if this happens, how do you manage that data size? So your first disk gets full, then your second disk gets full and so on. And you're wondering, how can I manage it? Now, the database management system, fortunately, is very neutral to the devices that you operate on. The database system remembers where what data has been stored. And no more it becomes your headache. So if I say policy number 2010, please access it. The database system knows which disk the data is stored. For example, you might have said that all members of the insurance company whose names begin with A are stored on disk A and all those beginning with the name B are stored on disk B, so on and so forth. So if they have, you have 26 disks on which data is stored, it can pretty much remember where to access the data from and that's the beauty of managing growth in the context of databases. It also provides location and device independence in the sense that you can change your disk. So if you had a small disk, you wanted to replace it with a bigger disk, you can replace it and the DBMS system functions as if nothing happened. And that's a great achievement for you. It can also handle, like I said, location-based services. So some part of your data is in Mumbai, some in Delhi, some in Calcutta. And if you shoot a request on the database saying that, please give me a list of customers from all the cities it will shoot a parallel query on all these uh, location specific databases, get the data, compile it together and present it to me as one single piece of information. Now, therefore you don't care as to where the data is stored as long as your query is answered. So your focus as a business user is to demand information and you get it from the database. Last but not the least is that database systems also allow you complex manipulations. Now this can be done if you write your own program using an external programming language. Now, however, databases are in their own walled garden, so to speak, they are enclosed. So if you write a program, there has to be a mechanism for your program, say in COBOL or whatever you write, to access the database system. And DBMS is therefore allow certain interfaces or interaction points where an external program can access database information, process it within the program and then give results the way you want. Now, this is a very powerful facility, particularly for business processing of complex nature. Now, if you look at data manipulation, the kind of manipulation that you can do, which is very powerful in DBMS is some of the more common functions that we hear about are things like uh, select, insert, update, and delete. These are four primary functions that you can perform or actions that you can perform on every entry of a database system. And SQL is the language which enables you to execute these commands. Some of that you can type and execute, but most of the time you embed SQL as part of a software program, such as in basic or any other language, and embed it and execute it on the database. Here's an example of uh, a create command and how you would write it. So create a table called phone numbers, which contains the uh, email access, email uh, code of the person. And then it has uh, uh, the mailing list, and it uh, which has a number type. 
and uh, various types of uh, data which you want to feed into it. So for example, the work email and the home uh, address and the cell phone number, etc. So these are examples of uh, commands such as create or there's a command here called insert just to give an illustration of what an SQL command looks like. Advantages of an RDBMS. Now, one of the primary advantage of course is uh, not just RDBMS, but this is I'm now talking about uh, particularly the uh, relational model. And uh, one of the advantages, it's a simple two-way table. So conceptually very easy, but more importantly, a two-way table has a very strong mathematical basis to it. So mathematical derivations could be done of the processing that you're doing. Uh, it's very flexible since we can query on any column. You can query on every table separately or you can have combined queries including multiple tables at the same time. The other is the database can grow very easily since any number of records can be added. Since it's just a table and column structure, you can keep on adding more rows as you get. So if you have an employee master, you have the employee code, name, etc., of one person, you go on adding as many employees who can join. You can even delete those who have vanished from your company. The database is therefore very expandable since it can just add columns on the right hand side just as it can add rows. And as a result, databases like Oracle, Sybase, SQL have become extremely popular. So RDBMS is the model which most companies work on. And with that, we come to the end of uh, the chapter eight, which is on database management systems. Thank you for joining me.